Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. Am I on? Am I? Okay. Great. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Yeah, a sinner whose hair is going white, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I tell you. Yeah. Yeah, this morning, um, you know, in the early service, and uh, I heard Sharon share those words, and, you know, it, it kind of, uh, 10 years ago, I was here, and I can remember that very, very well, and uh <laughs> And uh, I remember coming into that first service, and I mentioned it at the Sunday school. If you remember, I was, I was out of it. Number one, I was on California time, and, and in the hotel, there were uh, youth basketball teams staying in the hotel, and all literally all night long, you know, running up and down and slamming doors, and it was, it was really quite a uh, wonderful experience. <laughs> and I can just remember dragging in here, you know, and just this kind of half-crippled guy, and, um, and, and, but the neat thing is, uh, um, you know, God did his thing. God did his thing, and, uh, you know, as Johnny's saying, great, great is thy faithfulness. Um, and just the wonder of that. Just the absolute wonder of his faithfulness. Every once in a while it hits me that this whole Christian thing is, is just all so very simple. You know, I, I, I don't know what it is about we as people that we, we just love to complicate everything maybe. I don't know, but, but especially the things of God. It's, it's just all so very, very simple and, and, and breathtaking in its simplicity and... and and wonderful, and, you know, it's, it's just, his faithfulness is everything. His faithfulness is everything. You know, my contribution is, is, is nothing. I, and there's, what can I contribute? I'm nothing. And I think of the prophet, I can't remember his name, um, Mr. Bible Wizard here, but, uh, you know, it's either Isaiah or Jeremiah, one of the two guys, and, you know, they catch a glimpse of the living God. And, and their immediate reaction is, you know, I am undone. I'm just undone. And he, you know, and I can picture that moment physically, uh, you know, a guy just, just cowering and just, you know, in, in, in that much of a glimpse of a tiny, tiny fraction of a, of a you know, because uh, to see him in his entirety, it's so incomprehensible, you know, the mind would fry. So what the prophet saw that day was just like, you know, a nothing. <laughs> and, and yet, in, in the face of that, of that little tiny glimpse, his reaction is just to become undone. You know, I think of Daniel. He, he caught a glimpse of the living God. And in my memory, uh, it was him. It says, for seven days, couldn't get up. And just laying on the ground, shaking. <laughs> it's just for seven days. You know, to be confronted with the reality that, that I'm nothing in a good way. In a good way, in a wonderful way. I mean, the liberation of that. To know that I don't have to be anything. If I fail at everything I ever attempt in life, if I make every mistake there is to make, if I totally mess up at the end of the day because there came a moment in my life <laughs> where I acknowledged him, or because there came a moment in my life where I desired him and took a step to, you know, to activate that just, just I want you, Jesus, in my life, that because of that moment, he just waits for me with open arms, he just can't wait to see me. He just can't wait to just hold me in his arms for all eternity. It's just, and you think, oh, I'll, I'll go there, that, you know, it's, yeah, but Lord, didn't you see that thing that I messed up? And he'll just smile and he'll go, yeah, I saw it. Yeah, but Lord, I just made a mess. I just, I failed, you know, and, you know, and, and, and he'll go, yeah, I know. And the interesting thing is that the failure comes because of not trusting him, of not of not really fully planting myself in the middle of his faithfulness. May we learn the lesson over and over and over 
corporately and in our individual lives and in our national lives, that all of, the, all of our greatness, all of our technology, everything we can begin to build for ourselves, that at the end of the day, it's, it just can disappear like that. At the end of the day, it's just this fractured, crippled little thing that can easily be wiped out. You know, obviously on September 11th, <laughs> you know, we, we, we got jolted into reality that all of our securities, all of our national securities and everything were just as nothing. And the scary thing is that it didn't take us too long to just get right back in the saddle pretending as if we were secure. And oh, how we need to be like that prophet. Oh, how we need to be like Daniel and just, you know, I'm undone. I'm nothing. There's nothing that I can even begin to offer without pouring myself into dependency upon your faithfulness. I've never been married, but I have to guess, <laughs> judging from a lot of little jokes and things like that that I hear, that, uh, that, that to try to move in, 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 and build a successful family life, something tells me that's a challenging thing to do. Something tells me that takes a lot of work, man. Something tells me it's nothing like the movies. <laughs> you know, where everybody's smiling and everybody, you know, and it's just like it, something tells me it's a lot of work, man. Something tells me that the bottom line of that relationship, if it is to be successful, is self-sacrifice, self-sacrifice, self-sacrifice. And I just can't even imagine a guy would go into something so huge, something where the odds are so stacked against him. How can I say that? Because success is determined by self-sacrifice, and self-sacrifice is completely contrary to human nature. The Bible calls it sin nature. And, you know, I'm no expert on every, anything, but I have to guess that the bottom line of every relationship failure is self. I decided to do it, you know, for myself. And at the end of the day, self splits people apart. Self destroys, self-divides. And just for a guy to even begin to step into that kind of monumental pursuit, and maybe there's something to be discovered there, that it is a monumental pursuit. It's not this casual thing of, you know, <laughs> having your emotions tickled and then just going for it. It's just like, <laughs> it's a huge thing. But for a guy to step into that, and a lady, without getting on his face and just going, dear God, dear God, how can I even begin to tackle this area of life without your faithfulness, without you? Dear God, I plant myself right in the center of your faithfulness because I'm just totally fractured and weak and self-centered and there's no way I can do it outside of you. You're the only one that can provide me with what I need to do this right. I don't know how to be a leader, Lord. But in your faithfulness, you can give me what I need to do what it takes. You know, I spoke in the Sunday school and to the guys yesterday a little bit, you know, especially for a guy, and I, and I don't mean to beat up on the guys, but we're the leaders, you know. It's like, it's like Lord, you've given me this treasure. given me this treasure of your daughter. Yeah. Talk about fear of God. <laughs> Talk about something that will strike fear in a man's heart to monkey around with, <laughs> with the daughter of the king of kings. Yeah. Maybe that's why I'm still single. I don't want to mess with that, you know. <laughs> that's a scary proposition. It's like, no, thank you. I'll just stay over here in my corner. <laughs> But for a guy to, to step into things in a sense of self-sufficiency, in a sense of, oh, this is, I got this licked. Oh, my goodness. Hey, setting oneself up for a serious disaster, man. 
And on the other side of the coin, to just plant yourself with your nose in the carpet. You know? It's Lord. It's all got to do with your faithfulness. Lord, I'm nothing. I'm undone. Lord, it's only because of you that I can even stand up. And some people would think that's silly, but I'll tell you, go to the hospital and you'll meet a lot of people who can't. I'm telling you, man, it all has to do with him. The whole reason this world as we know it, the whole reason that we got clothes to wear and there's some element of peacefulness and some element of, of conducting organized life in rest and relaxation is all because of that day he hung on that piece of wood. If not for that day, then we're just lunch for the enemy. <laughs> He's got an open door to just march into every corner of our lives and just take us out. It's all because of his faithfulness. And I think of 2,000 years ago. And if I can really oversimplify, there's actually, you know, the people that Jesus encountered actually kind of fell into one of those two camps. You know, there was the camp of people who thought they had their stuff together, who thought they knew how to, how to do religious life, who thought they knew, you know, what was good for the country and all this kind of stuff. Highly opinionated, Highly full of self. And then there was the other camp. The lepers. And the blind people. And the people whose kids had just died. And the widows who were left without support. And the people that the, you know, society at large just laughed at and scorned. These people were the ones. <laughs> they could look at their bodies. They could look at their lives. They could, they could, their failures were in front of their face 24-7. And when confronted with that, they knew what we all just need to know. I need Jesus. Without him, I am undone. Without him, I've got nothing there's a whole other fascinating thing. You know, you think of that guy who, uh, you know, it says, the Bible calls him the man with leprosy. And that's kind of a clean way to, you know, kind of a very uh, sanitized way of, of describing what was a very real, living, breathing human being 2,000 years ago. This was a man who's, you know, by virtue of this disease, it, it, it's indescribable. <laughs> It's indescribable the, the filth. It's indescribable the, the smell. It's indescribable the ugliness. You know, you've got, you know, just, just sores opening all over his body. You've got bone turning to chalk. You've got, you know, it's just, it's just, just chunks of scalp falling out. It's just, it's so horrific. You know, most of you know, I've spent a lot of time in Africa, and I remember running into some uh, medical missionaries that spent time in Sudan, and, uh, and, uh, and they told me that um, every morning they treat the lepers in their hospital. And, and they'll wake up every morning, the lepers will be lined up around the hospital. And he said, before they treat them, this is a little bit rough, forgive me for this, they go through the line with a pair of tweezers and they pull the maggots out of their sores. That's what it was 2,000 years ago. If you can imagine their level of medical technology 2,000 years ago, you know, you multiply that by, you know, <laughs> that's who was standing in front of Jesus 2,000 years ago. The horror, the rejection. One of the interesting things about, about the Gospels, and it's a thing that I missed before I did that movie, that I played Jesus in, is that all these characters that Jesus meets, the leper, the blind man, even the Pharisees, that's the hardest one to swallow, they're all me. I am that leper. I mean, before I came to Jesus, my spirit, my soul looked like that. 
Now, we tend to think of ourselves as not being so bad, <laughs> you know? We read the newspaper, we say, okay, that guy's bad. <laughs> you know, he's, he's bad news, but, but sin is sin. Sin is sin in a broken creation, and, you know, whether, whether I'm out there shooting people or whether I'm just living college life and just sinning like crazy, sin is sin, and it all looks exactly the same to the living God. And so without me even realizing it, I am that guy who 2,000 years ago had that physical manifestation of, of, of horror, of everything that life was never meant to be. You know, the living God, he sets up creation, and if I can have a little fun, he, he plants these two perfect naked people running around in, you know, in the forest just having a great time eating apples that are this big and just having a great time in the Garden of Eden. And, and you know, that's his idea of, of his perfect will for our lives. It's a fascinating thing. We all know that, that once Adam and Eve sinned, one of the first things that hit them was shame. You know, it phrases it very kind of poetic, you know, they covered their nakedness. And it sounds so interesting, but you, can you imagine life without shame? Can you imagine freedom from that one thing? Any sense of embarrassment about anything, you know, your hair, your, your weight, your physicality, your, you know, the way you speak. Can you imagine freedom from that? And these little things that cause us shame, something that God never intended for any of our lives. And you can gain, begin to gain a picture of what God's hope for our lives is and was from the very beginning. Just freedom from all these things that, that end up dictating our lives and ruling our lives. I mean, how many of us, because of some rejection we experienced 10, 15, 20 years ago. We ended up living that out in our behavior and our reactions for the rest of our lives. Can you imagine freedom from all that stuff? And can you hear the whisper of the living God saying, that's my will for your life? You know, we talk about the will of God. What's God's will for my life? And we tend to think vocationally. What does he want us to do? And that's a part of it. But where he's at is who he wants us to be. And who he wants us to be is free. Free from those things. Free from the, the stuff that just complicates and weighs on us and makes us act silly. How many times do we say things and we think, what a stupid thing, why did I say that? It's words out of the mouth that are born in rejection and shame and feeling funny and competitiveness and all these funny things that were never God's perfect will for our lives. And the freedom from all that. And so in the same way that, that the leper approaches Jesus 2,000 years ago with all these physical manifestations of, of brokenness, before I came to Jesus, before anybody in this room came to Jesus, you know, if we could see in the Spirit, that's what we look like. Just broken, 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 festering with all sorts of terrible things, things that were never God's will for our lives. And this guy does what I'm going to guess most of us in this room have done. You faced that at one point in your life. Wow, I need Jesus. You cast all the religion aside and all the religious posturing and, and, and all these kinds of things. And, you know, at the end of the day, it, I don't want to say it all means nothing, but it's like at the end of the day, it all boils down to me and him eye to eye. And I picture that, G, that leper guy 2,000 years ago. He's, you know, he's just, he's... Now, how many years has he been like that? How much has he suffered at the hands of people? 
cruel tongues and rejections and funny, terrible things. And he comes to a place in his life where he knows, I am nothing, and that guy is everything, and I need him. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care how embarrassing it will be to bear my wounds in front of the village. I don't care what people will think. All I care about is getting that guy, if I can phrase it that way. And I picture him that day 2,000 years ago, and, you know, and the, and the smell, it, it just, you know, it is just, it's his last chance. He spent every dollar on doctors. He's, you know, he's, he's he... and the exact phrasing, if we translate it word for word, it's, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And sometimes we read that, and it sounds very, like we picture the guy like, Lord, if thou be willing, you know what I mean? We picture it like that. But it wasn't like that, too. It was real life. It was a guy desperate to regain his life. I picture him, you know, he's just, he sees Jesus. He's got to, you know, there's crowds around Jesus. He's got to somehow get through that crowd. He's not going to let anything interfere with him getting to Jesus. That's a very catchphrase right there. And somehow he's got to rise over the roar of all the people. Somehow he's got to get his attention among the 500 people or whoever was there that day. And, and I just picture this guy, it's just, it, just, it just comes out of him that, you know, Lord! It's like a cry of desperation. You know, and Jesus, it just turns. Wow. Wow. He's got the attention of the Son of the living God. I picture the guy just bearing his, 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 his dirt. This is a huge thing I'm about to say. You know, sometimes we think we got to be a certain way to come to the Lord. Sometimes we think we got to, okay, I drink too much. I got to clean that up before I can go to the Lord. You know, I got to do A, B, I got to stop smoking before I come to the Lord. This guy 2,000 years ago, it's a huge lesson for us all. He only had one thing to offer Jesus 2,000 years ago. His dirt. He didn't come to him with any, you know, here's my turtle dove, here's my uh, spotless lamb, you know, uh, I just spent uh, the week in synagogue, I'm all studied up. He just, he had nothing to offer Jesus that day except his filth, his brokenness, and the awareness and the acknowledgement of his brokenness. And he just lays it at the feet of Jesus, Lord. In other words, look at me. If you are willing. You just picture the tears coming down this guy's face. You can make me clean. Translation, all I've got is you. All I've got is you. And the living God himself. I spoke about this in the earlier service today. You know, we, we, we tend to miss this was God 2,000 years ago. This was, this was the wow of wows. This is as big as it gets. This is so <laughs> huge, you know. And we, and we tend in our familiarity, our Christian familiarity, we tend to miss that. This man was God, you know. He, he turns, he looks at you. You're literally looking into the eyes of, of the kingdom of God alive. It's so huge. It's so, it's so breathtaking. It's just, it's just a mind-blowing thing. And I imagine Jesus that day, you know, he just, he just, he just turns, you know, he just eye to eye with this guy. And I would imagine there were people 2,000 years ago laughing at him. I would imagine uh, there were followers of Jesus saying, oh, Jesus, you know, we'll just don't worry, we'll give that guy a fish sandwich and, you know, he doesn't have to bother you, you're too important, and all this kind of stuff going on around him. And Jesus just makes a beeline through the crowd to this guy. It must have exploded their minds 2,000 years ago. Gets right down in the dirt with that guy. Eye to eye, you know. And I imagine the guy, he tries to hide his filth. 
We all do. See, I'm not dramatizing. I'm just inserting human nature. We all try to hide our filth. And I imagine him just, you know, he doesn't want anybody to see the sores on his face. And, the, and I remember uh, the way we did it in the film that we did was, was the guy actually turned and cowered and turned his back to Jesus. And Jesus came around and he got right down in the dirt with him and he lifts his face, takes the rags off his face, you know, wipes the tears from his eyes. It's astounding, Jesus' response. In light of what he could have responded with. In light of the ways that we often respond. You know, it's, I'm going to make a joke here. He's, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus could have said, well, um, you know, have you been studying the scriptures? Why don't you go back and study the scriptures and then come back and I'll make you clean. You know, why don't you, uh, you know, make a list of your sins and for two weeks prove that you can rise above these things and then come back and I'll sort you out. Jesus could have said that. He could have said, look, <laughs> you know, I'm the living God, man. <laughs> I've had a long day. I've been doing the Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, you know, you've been a leper for 10 years. What's another day? Why don't you come around? I'll be at Peter's house tomorrow, and we'll just take, take care of you. I'm hungry. And it's kind of funny to think that Jesus would do that. But it's even more funny that he doesn't do that. He's God. You see how we miss that? He's God. If anybody's got a right to say, come around tomorrow, it's God. But he doesn't. When the whole world is telling this guy, come back tomorrow. The living God. I like to say, if anybody's got important things to do, it's Jesus the living God stops everything he's doing for that guy. Wow. I like to say that there were two miracles that day, the lesser of which is the physical healing from the disease. That's easy. He's God. Be healed. But the big miracle, the lesson that, that I feel very strongly the Lord really wants me to take away from that story is that he stopped for that. Again, he's God. He gets right down in the dirt. I am willing. Be clean. Wow. Wow. And I picture that whole bank of, of guys watching this thing, guys who thought they had God figured out. Guys who studied, you know, the Torah and they, they memorized it and they dressed it and they ate the right things and they just did all the right things. They weren't bad guys. We tend to think of them as bad guys, but they weren't. They just didn't get that which Johnny's saying, great is thy faithfulness as opposed to my faithfulness. They just didn't get that in his face I am undone. No, oh, can you imagine? <laughs> you know, can you imagine what that would be like? Uh, you know, Sharon spoke about um, the new film we, we want to make, and you know, it's very important what she talked about, about how uh, you know, we've got to bring the gospel story into a cutting-edge film dynamic. Audiences today are so sophisticated, and you know, but then the trick there is to not make it about the special effects. Um, and, and, you know, because there's just no way you could reenact these things. <laughs> uh, uh, there's just, it's just impossible. So just the fact that we would even try it. In fact, we've seen movies try it, like even that little thing like uh, after Jesus is risen from the dead when he shows up in the room, um, uh, all the apostles are gathered in the upper room and it says that he, he came in even though the door was locked. And we've seen that scene in movies and it always looks kind of corny. You know, it's just like, 
you know, suddenly there's this guy there, and it's just, you know, and it just, it's just kind of silly looking, you know, and, and the reason it's silly looking is because all the special effects in the world, you know, you know, 25th century special effects couldn't even come close to reenacting a work of God. And so the trick is, is to not go there, but at the same time use those special effects to, to support the wow factor. This is God. This is God. In fact, if I may, um, the very first time we see Jesus, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you the opening scenes. Can I do that? Okay. In the opening scenes, you know, in, in, in John, it's, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay. So what we see in the beginning is, um, well, we hear, uh, okay, the screen is black. I hope I can pull this off. The screen is black. And we hear the voices of the ancient prophets. You know, he was anointed with the oil of joy above his brethren. You know, and we just hear all the messianic uh, prophecies just speaking in the dark. And then, and then suddenly, the, it's called a smash cut. The screen just, it just explodes in, in, in light. And it's like a rush of light like you never saw light. And, and it's like you're on a roller coaster skyrocketing through this, through this magnificence. <laughs> and you're just, and, and, you know, and you begin to hear the words. In the beginning was the word. And the word, and, the, and, and you're skyrocketing towards something in the middle of the light that is obviously the source of the light. Jesus. You know, and you're, it's like you're going 50,000 miles an hour toward this thing, you know, and, and the sound is, that I'm making is, 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 it's big. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and then suddenly you enter into the immediate presence of this figure, and it's like, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and there's this, this figure, <laughs> this divine figure, and it's just so big. It's God, man, and, just, and he's got a planet in his hands, and he's molding this planet, you know, and he looks right into the camera. In other words, he looks right into your heart, and he smiles, and he goes back to his creation, and he just like, and the world just... Just, just, you know, moves toward the camera and the dialogue continues. Uh, through him all things were created. Nothing was created that was created without him. And the planet, um, you know, just fills the screen and then moves off to the side. And suddenly you see the galaxy and you begin to plummet toward ancient Israel. And you're there in Galilee. And, uh, you know, and then you juxtapose that creation with a man in a carpenter shop. The word became flesh. You suddenly you hear the sounds of sawing. <laughs> Close-ups of these arms and you know, sweat glistening and mingling with the sawdust and these hands caked with dirt and dirt under the fingernails. It's all close-ups on the hands and the shoulder, big powerful shoulder and, you know, and all this. Blah, blah, blah. And, um, and then you cut to this little girl outside the shop and she's got a lamb in her arms and the... And the uh, leg, a little lamb's leg is, is fractured, and she's just weeping and weeping and weeping. And in the background, we see the slow motion, you know, the feet, you know, moving toward her. It's the feet of Jesus. We haven't seen his face yet. And then, um, you know, uh, the camera turns around so that we see her point of view, and, and he just slowly descends into the shot, and, boom, and suddenly there's this face. And these eyes that say the same thing 100% of the time. I just love you. I just love you. And then he reaches his thumb. This is a very, very significant thing. Because there's that scripture that says he wipes the tears from our eyes. Jesus was the word became flesh. In other words, he was this thing alive. The voice of God, the expression of God alive. If you, if you look at every word Jesus spoke, you can trace it back to the first, you know, the Old Testament. Everything Jesus did was just redo the Old Testament. <laughs> you know, every word he spoke, he, he didn't bring new teachings. 
He just, he just was the living fulfillment of everything that was prophesied a thousand years before. And in the same thing, in the same way, everything he did was the word. And so there's specific things where he literally does the word. So we see him uh, pointedly reach his thumb into this little girl's eyes and wipe the tears from her eyes. Wow. And then, you know, what he's been working on is a little splint for this little lamb, and he puts it on, and the lamb is okay. The girl's all excited, and, uh, you know, hee, 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 and she throws herself into Jesus' arms, and it's all very lovely and pretty and nice and beautiful and, uh, and intimate. We miss that. And, and then the little girl goes running off, and, and Jesus, it's, you know, he's down here with the little girl, and she turns, and, and he, just, he just waves. And, and then you get, um, I'm trying to think of the scripture, where it says, um, oh, I can't remember, but it's a big scripture, something like, uh, you know, in him was, was, was light, and that light was the light of the world, or something like, it was one of the big things. And in slow motion, you know, we've seen this gentle, smiling guy, he just suddenly just... And he stands there, whoa. And he's like this, this guy with his feet planted in the ground, this, this image of, of a man. <laughs> you know, of a man among men with his feet wide and his feet firmly planted and, you know, the hair just blowing and the robes flapping in the wind. This, this image that says, this man is God. You know, and he, and he lifts a final wave and he turns back. <laughs> over and over. In John, Jesus says, I am, I am, I am. And I think we often miss that that's the name of God. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, I am the bread of life, before Abraham was born, I am. I am the good shepherd. What he's actually saying is, I am God, am the good shepherd. He's giving them the name of God. That's why they keep trying to throw rocks at him. And, and so, whereas if you've seen the previous movie we did, the... Uh, the focal point was the joy of Jesus. In, in the new one, um, we, will, we will not lose any of that joy. It'll all be about joy and passion. But the central statement will be this I am over and over. Jesus will be this, this very heroic figure. Uh, you know, I hate to put it this way. If you saw that movie 300, you know, and the way those guys were, they're just these <laughs> mountain of, uh, you know, there's just these heroic figures marching against all odds for right and justice. And, and that's the kind of presentation it will be. The living God. The living God manifest in our broken world. And with every one of those actions, with every move, with every time he <laughs> reaches his hand into a little girl's to wipe the tears, with every, every leper that he embraces, and can you imagine he holds that guy and the guy's stuff gets all over him, you know? And I started to say earlier, can you imagine that moment when the guy's body gets healed? Can you imagine? What must that be like? I mean, he says... <laughs> He's just like, <laughs> you know, just the rush of health going through his body, the, the life of the Spirit of God, you know, just, you know, healing bones and mending, you know, tendons and, and muscles. And just, you know, it just must be, it's not like those movies where, where, where you just see the face and then suddenly the scars disappear and you hear, behind him. It's not like that. You're talking about the power of God just skyrocketing into this guy's brokenness, man. I think of Lazarus rising from the dead. I mean, it's not like, you know, this guy all wrapped up comes out like this, you know. <laughs> it wasn't like that. And everybody goes, oh, are you kidding me, man? The guy was dead, you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, on the way here, I passed by a cemetery. Can you imagine if you're driving along and the ground explodes and some guy, you know, how would you react to that? Even the most stoic Hoosier would, would, would just, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I can promise you he wouldn't go, oh, look at that, Ethel, wow. I'll have to look at the news later and see what that's all about. I can promise you the most stoic, hardcore guy would just freak out. <laughs> and people running in every direction, people pulling their kids away. and That's what it was, that's what it was. 
And through every one of those moments and interactions, whether it be wiping the tear from a little girl's eyes or, or just standing there just in front of a grave going, death, you're nothing compared to me. With every one of them, the living God says, please, please understand who I am. Please understand what I offer you. Please understand how to best position yourself to receive the fullness of all that those guys did. And that best position is very, very simple, uncomplicated, doesn't take a Bible study. Lord, I'm undone. Lord, I'm nothing without you. Lord, great is your faithfulness. Your God. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not God of nothing. I can't even be God of myself. I can't figure this out for the life of me. Lord, if there's anything you've got to beat out of me, it's my self-sufficiency and my self-reliance and my self-righteousness and my thinking that I've actually got something licked. Lord, beat that stuff out of me so I can get into the place where that leper was. Why do I want to be there? Because that's the place of seeing the fullness of all that he is in every corner of our lives. Great is your faithfulness. Jesus, of all the things that I think I need, I need one thing, and that's you and you and you and you. And his response is always, I love you. I love you. If you just come and keep coming, I'll take care of this. I'll take care of that. I'll sort it out for you. I will give you the equipment you need to lead your household. I will give you the equipment you need to be faithful to your wife and children. I can do that. I can overcome every weakness on your behalf because in your weakness, my strength, which is the power of the universe, is perfected. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let's pray. Pastor, if you want to. Lord, I thank you for precious, precious people. I thank you, Lord, for this, this community. This community is, just inspires me, Lord God, just to see the